Welcome everyone to our webinar this afternoon. We're delighted you're here to join us. Uh, as uh, you can see, our topic for the day is Russia and Ukraine, the politics of resentment. This panel uh, has been in the works for a couple of weeks. And as you well know, um, events on the ground and in Europe have changed tremendously over these last few weeks. And uh, we are, I know, all concerned about um, how things will play out. We're concerned about friends and colleagues, and um, we're anxious to understand more about um, what's happening in uh, Ukraine. So we have assembled for you today a, uh, a group of panelists who will help to shed some light on what's happening in Europe uh, and the background and context for uh, what we're seeing emerging uh, in front of us, and um, also who will help us to understand maybe where things are, are moving. So I would like to, uh, again, uh, just in providing context, uh, put up a quick map of uh, Ukraine and its various regions. I think important for us to just remind ourselves of where Ukraine is and its really strategic central role in Europe. Uh, I know some of our speakers will be referring to, the, to this, but uh, certainly with the very extensive Russian border on the east, uh, the southern uh, ports on the Black Sea, and then the western uh, borders with many of uh, the Eastern European countries uh, formerly in under the uh, Soviet sphere. So one of the reasons why this is such, I think, again, an important uh, moment for uh, NATO, for the West, for Russia, um, for China, for all of our uh, international global um, trading partners and um, allies is exactly this strategic location of Ukraine. Uh, so let me go back uh, to this slide and introduce our panelists. I want to move straight to uh, them and let them have the longest possible time to share with you. We expect that we will go um, with uh, uh, 10 or 15 minutes for each panelist, and we should have 25 or so minutes at the close of the uh, webinar to uh, invite your questions and comments uh, for the panelists. So please do keep those in mind. Or if you like, you can drop questions into the Q&A um, uh, icon at the, at, well, uh, on your screen somewhere, the top or bottom of your screen. And we can be sort of looking at those and, and um, culling through those as the speakers proceed. So please do, if you have questions, feel free to drop those into uh, the Q&A feature in this webinar. One final remark before we start, we are recording this uh, so that we can share it with uh, quite a number of people who have asked uh, to see it uh, who couldn't be present today. So we will be sharing this uh, webinar recording out um, to other members of our community. So with that, those items in mind, uh, I'm going to start uh, with our uh, very welcome guest, Conrad Turner. Uh, Conrad Turner uh, was Minister Counselor of the Foreign Service of the United States of America. He has retired as of about two months ago. So um, Conrad is, I think, speaking for himself as an American citizen today. Um, but Conrad uh, has a very long career in diplomacy uh, for the US government. David Schmidt and I met him when we were working in Ukraine on a project related to academic integrity, which uh, Conrad was Conrad's brainchild and uh, well on its way to implementation um, as of uh, just the last few months. So Conrad, I'm going to turn it to you and ask you to kick us off with some remarks from your perspective um, in, um, as, as, as a, a diplomat, please. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, always great to see you and David and your colleagues. Uh, and by the way, I, I could not see the map. Uh, if, uh, if it's possible to put it up, uh, even as I'm talking, that would be great. Um, uh, I, I spoke uh, in anticipation of this call. I spoke uh, a couple of days ago with a, uh, 
uh, somebody I worked with closely in, in Ukraine a few years ago uh, to get a sense of what things were like on the ground. Uh, he told uh, an amazing story. Um, it's it's going to be similar to other stories we've heard. Uh, a Ukrainian public figure who uh, clearly was following what's going on, uh, he was surprised uh, when the Russians actually decided to attack. Uh, I, I think Ukraine in general did not expect this to happen. And um, it, even the, uh, the the US intelligence that, that was released, uh, it was difficult to believe. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, they didn't believe it would happen because it would be so stupid. Uh, and that's uh, in quotes there, that's what, that's what he said. Uh, Putin's plan uh, to slow reforms, to uh, prevent integration with Europe was uh, largely succeeding uh, with the war going on. Uh, the economy had been devastated. Uh, a recent calculation was there was uh, that, that, that Ukraine had lost 280 billion uh, over the course of uh, just six years. Um, but there they were, 4 a.m. Uh, they heard explosions, uh, and uh, within a couple of hours, they got themselves ready out into a into a traffic jam. He and his family uh, right into a traffic jam. Uh, eventually, they made their way to a friend's place where they stayed, and then the next day they moved uh, out, but closer to an airport, uh, which turned out to be um, maybe not the best move. Uh, they heard uh, a crash out there, which was the sound of a Russian plane uh, being shot down. Uh, they moved again, and uh, this was uh, after two days, they decided this is enough, the family has to leave. Um, he, he took them to the border. Uh, there were lines. Uh, at the border, uh, long lines. Uh, they were lucky enough to uh, get a, a ride with the Red Cross and uh, they were able to uh, go across the border on foot. Uh, and he, he remained behind. Uh, I, I emphasize that uh, this family was lucky and we're seeing lots of examples of, uh, of not so lucky families who are struggling to get out of town now. Um, I want to add that he, uh, he expressed gratitude for the humanitarian aid, especially going to refugees right now. But he quickly added that what Ukraine really needs right now is weapons, uh, weapons and uh, medicines and medical equipment. Um, just uh, still on that note, uh, it's, it's a little strange. I'm still trying to get my head around it. The people I worked with who became my friends uh, are now carrying weapons. Uh, they are um, living in basements. Uh, they are uh, around the world demonstrating uh, and their morale is high. Uh, they do believe that they could prevail. Uh, I was, um, a headline I saw in the Washington Post this morning uh, made me think back to when I was a First, first a student in, uh, in Moscow in 1982. I hesitate to say that, it dates me, but um, I came to a, a country that was closed. Uh, propaganda was very strong. Uh, the only outside information was VOA, Voice of America and BBC. Um, and even that was jammed. Uh, the, the country had a costly war on its border. Uh, there were food shortages, there were lines for sketchy products. Uh, there were no business ties. Uh, and you can kind of see where I'm going with this. Uh, it, it's just very interesting to see Russia back into a, a similar situation. But I hesitate to say that it is very, very different today for many reasons. Um, but I raise this because uh, I, I'm, I understand many of the listeners and watchers uh, today are future leaders. And I just uh, want to emphasize that uh, history, emphasize the importance of history and political science. Uh, you, you, you learn that things do repeat themselves, that certain problems never quite go away. Uh, and uh, it's, it's been said many times, but uh, if you don't uh, learn history, you, are, you may be doomed to repeat it. 
Uh, the topic is, uh, is resentment. And uh, certainly there's a, a lot today to be resentful about. Uh, Ukraine has been at war with uh, Russia who invaded, uh, I guess, eight years ago now, seven, eight. Uh, uh, on the on Putin's uh, part, uh, I understand uh, we, we are led to believe that he is uh, resentful of the, the uh, collapse of the USSR and the uh, expansion of NATO. Um, and here it's really important to remember that uh, although history is alive in this part of the world, uh, dictators use and abuse that history. Um, and it's not just history, it's their history. And uh, they don't have a right necessarily over, they don't have a right over the history of another country. And uh, Ukraine has its own history. Um, I, I wanna go back to uh, uh, another time when I was working in Moscow and uh, Russia is a big country. It's uh, a powerful country. Uh, and it projects power. And I found, uh, even as a, as a diplomat, uh, I found it very easy to get sucked into that mentality. And I noticed that, that others, journalists and uh, uh, other diplomats, uh, seem to go the same direction. And that is, uh, when something's happening uh, on Russia's border, the message you get is, look, we're Russia. Don't mess with us. And uh, it's very easy to think, well, okay, yes, those people on the periphery, they are kind of uppity. Um, uh, and uh, I discovered that uh, coming to Ukraine, uh, I'd been there uh, several times before, you, you think you're coming to a, a former Soviet Republic, even after whatever it is, 30 years uh, of, uh, of post-Soviet era, uh, but within a couple or three days, you realize you are in a modern European liberal democracy uh, with its own culture, its own borders, uh, its, uh, its own UN representation, its own embassies. And uh, then Russia looms from afar as, as a bully. Uh, this, the, the psychology of, of this is really important because it spills out into the media, it spills out into uh, discussions like this uh, very easily. And Russia tends to suck the air out of the room. And it's really important for us to think in terms of Ukraine as an independent country. Um, and here, I just wanna mention the extraordinary power that I've observed in, in my career of, uh, of propaganda and disinformation. It really does work. And, uh, and Russia's good at it. And I've, I've heard people say it's, it's, uh, it's genius and uh, the way they do it, and it's not. Uh, it, it's something that uh, has, uh, it dates back to the era of the czars and uh, certainly the, the Soviet period. It's something that's been refined and been adapted to modern times. Uh, but it exists for a reason. And this is something that we all need to be aware of, I think, uh, in our own uh, uh, thinking of the, uh, of the pro thinking of events and discussions. Uh, and I, I, I'm thinking of a, a, a soccer metaphor when I was in high school. Uh, I was the final defender with, uh, with somebody coming at me trying to score on our goal. And uh, he, as he approached me, I, all I remember is I, I found myself on the ground and he had gone on to score. And uh, when I came off the field, I asked the coach, uh, I, I said, I don't know what happened. He said, he faked you. And um, uh, that's really what this kind of propaganda is. It's faking. Uh, obviously there's some truth behind it, but the point is to get us to uh, doubt ourselves, to doubt the situation. Uh, and there's a, a wonderful quote from Timothy Snyder, uh, the historian. Uh, the one consistent element of Russian propaganda is that Russia has suffered and that it is the West's fault, your fault. You are meant to be shocked, blame yourself and make concessions. 
Uh, I've seen a lot of discussion about NATO expansion and I've seen articles uh, questioning whether this was a smart thing to do. Uh, I'm one of those people who actually believes that it was a very smart thing to do. And of course, this, this had to be done. And it made all the sense in the world. But there, I understand others who have a, a different opinion. Uh, what is really important, though, is for uh, us to set our divisions aside, uh, because divisions is what Moscow tries to sow. The more I think about this uh, invasion, uh, what it, it, the more I believe that this is not about policy strategy. Uh, this is all about Putin. Uh, because uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, it didn't make any sense. He had bad information. Uh, and this is kind of, this is what you get when you rule by fear. People don't want to tell you the truth. Uh, he also, uh, I think, <laughs> suffered from availability bias. And uh, I've believed for a long time that the reason why Putin uh, has such low esteem of Ukrainians um, is I believe that is, that is how he feels about his own people. Uh, and uh, he looks to available information for, for his decision making. Uh, it's very unfortunate, and I think Russians deserve better leadership. Um, and also confirmation bias. Uh, in his past acts of uh, uh, invasions and uh, pressure on his uh, neighbors, the, the West has uh, not resisted strongly, let's put it mildly. And he believed that, uh, that he was safe in taking on Ukraine. Uh, I also believe that he still misunderstands Ukraine and Ukrainians. Uh, Ukraine is united. Uh, their morale is high. Uh, they will fight and they will continue fighting, even if he takes Kyiv, uh, even if he resorts to Stalinist tactics, uh, which I wouldn't exclude. Uh, this mess that he's created is going to eat away at his, at his rule. For our part, uh, if we don't step forward and help Ukraine to, to prevail, to survive, to thrive, uh, this could be the mistake of the century. Uh, they need our help. They deserve our help. Um, let's not make a, a huge failure of imagination. If there's some things that we can't provide, there are others that we can. And uh, I'll just close with uh, a mention of the uh, let's say the bear in the room, uh, the the oil situation, and uh, I've seen discussion of uh, talking with Venezuela and even Iran about uh, supplying oil that um, that we are uh, re refusing to take from Russia. Uh, if climate disaster is not enough of a motivation to get people to 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 finally take the brave step of moving away from fossil fuels. Uh, this conflict uh, should be. We have funded this war. Uh, we have funded Russia's military and we've fun funded uh, the Kremlin's yachts uh, I, and I can go on. Thanks. Thank you so much, Conrad, for getting us started with those uh, really helpful comments. Um, I dropped Conrad's bio into the chat um, and you'll certainly see his breadth of experience in Eastern Europe. Um, I, I've heard wonderful stories from Conrad of his time in Russia um, early on, and uh, he has a, a breadth of understanding, I think, of the entire region. So thanks so much for that, um, that introduction. So um, let's move on. I'm going to stop this share for a moment and um, see if I can get a better picture for you. Uh, and I'd like to introduce uh, our next speaker, David McFadden. Uh, David McFadden is professor uh, of history uh, special, specializing in Russian history in uh, the College of Arts and Sciences at Fairfield University. 
Uh, David has been a dear colleague of mine, did lots of work early on in the 90s uh, with our faculty to engage us in learning more about Russia and better understanding uh, the uh, demise of the Soviet empire. So David, I'll turn it to you and um, ask you uh, to provide us with some of your insights. Thank you. Uh, I would like to, first of all, I wanna say that I am totally opposed to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I wanna make that very clear. But what I'd like to do for a few minutes is to give you a little bit of historical background in understanding more about why Russia did this and what kind of historical context is helpful for our broader understanding. First of all, although um, Putin likes to say that Russia and Ukraine are one people, there is just a bit of truth to that, and we need to understand that. Russian civilization started in Kievan Rus and spread then to the north and eventually Moscow, and there has always been a very close tie between Russia and Ukraine, which was amplified then, of course, during the Soviet period. And we also need to understand, because part of that is the context here, Putin's capture of Crimea uh, from Ukraine uh, is, from Putin's point of view, redressing an old wrong, because Catherine the Great first conquered Crimea in the 1780s for Russia, and most of Crimea is Russian, ethnic Russians and Russian speakers. Then there is this other question, which is, I think, very important for us to understand. In the 1990s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of an independent Russia, there were numerous conversations in the Bush administration with Russian colleagues on two big issues. One, the United States promised not to extend NATO to Russia's borders. And number two, the United States endeavored to bring Russia into a partnership with NATO to relieve, relieve Russia's security concerns. Now, this was all forgotten in later years with the expansion of NATO to the East European countries right up to Russia's border. So I think that politics of resentment is a very important issue here for Russia. Russia feels resentful that they were wronged by the United States. They were wronged by NATO. We didn't take their concerns seriously and their, sec their security concerns uh, have always been forgotten or a minor issue uh, for the West. So looking forward, how can, how can this be changed? What can be done to allay Russia's security concerns? Well, first of all, I think it's extremely important to end this war. And whatever France and Germany, and I hope the United States can do to bring Ukrainians and Russians together to end this war, that's crucial. And as part of the ending of the war, we have to be able to start dealing with Russia's security concerns. We need to support Ukraine, but we also need to understand Russia and try to get past that. Finally, I want to remind us that the Russian people do not necessarily, in fact, mostly they do not, support this war. There have been tremendous demonstrations all over Russia in city after city after city calling for no war. The signs, no war. And 
over 10,000 Russian citizens have been arrested because of their concern over the war and their desiring of peace. Many Russians have Ukrainian relatives. Many Ukrainians have Russian relatives. We need to get past this. We need to, de we need to uh, find a way to address Russia's security concerns as well as our support for Ukraine. I think the United States needs to do much more to try to end the war. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Um, I think, again, that, that history of, of Russian um, perspective is really important to, to, to think about as we seek uh, solutions to the, to the impasse. So super helpful. Thank you. Um, I'd like to bring in Janie Leatherman, another dear colleague of mine from the Politics Department and International Studies Program. Um, Janie also has rich experience in, in European politics and spent time in Finland and other parts of Europe um, during her career. So I'll turn it to Janie um, to give us a, a, maybe a broader perspective on um, the European uh, political um, context. So Janie, please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kathy. Um, I did actually have the good fortune of uh, Fulbright to Finland as a doctoral candidate and support from the American Scandinavian Foundation. And that was an opportunity to build on relationships that I had formed even in high school with the Finnish exchange student and, and actually um, study uh, Finnish diplomacy in the context of the Cold War um, between the East and the West. And so, I came to have a fairly fine-tuned um, understanding of what it felt like to be countries um, sandwiched, you know, as it were, literally between the blocks. And there were a number of, you know, remarkable experiences that came along with that work. <clears throat> One of them was uh, talking to diplomats as the Cold War was kind of winding down, and finding that that there was a buzz in the halls of diplomacy in Europe about how. Uh, a Polish diplomat had walked into negotiations in Vienna and taken a seat on the Western side because there were apparently no other seats on the Eastern side and nobody could believe that that had happened. And some few years after the Cold War ended, I, I remember being in, in NATO headquarters in Brussels on a seminar and learning about the new mechanism that NATO set up immediately after the end of the Cold War, which was called Partnership for Peace. And very quickly, all the Eastern European countries were standing at the door knocking and wanting to have a relationship with, with NATO. And it was truly remarkable you know, to be walking down the hallways of the Partnership for Peace and think that a few years earlier, I mean, these were you know, folks who were formally speaking our enemies with NATO. And one of the, the officials uh, joked that the dartboard at the end of the hall was now a target that everybody could, you know, aim at to, together. Um, but the country that was left out of that picture really was Russia. And as uh, Professor McFadden noted, um, that has been really the conundrum of trying to resolve the remaining kinds of difficulties of creating a, a world order in the post-Cold War um, period. So I would just like to make a, a few remarks um, here about the challenges really of not just the European landscape, but of world order. Um, as, as many commentators have, have reflected in the last week or two, that what's happening today seems to be upending um, world order as we've known it since 1945, or some may, may go back even further to 1648 when the Peace of Westphalia was signed and the principles of state sovereignty and territorial integrity um, were anchored in the foundations of a, a world system based on nation states that emerged from that uh, juncture. Um, to try to wrap my head around this question of is world order somehow at, 
at risk of, of unraveling and turning in new directions. Um, I just noticed that, or, or note that, that I began to notice around about 2017, that there were many references, especially in, in the media, to things happening in the world that were unprecedented. And, and I, I started to pay attention to this word. And in article after article, I would encounter, yeah, this is an unprecedented and that's unprecedented. And of course, we've heard it just over the last couple of weeks again and again, that the invasion by Russia into Ukraine is in many ways unprecedented kind of military action, um, unprecedented aggression against a neighboring country for purposes of territorial um, um, acquisition um, and control, um, unprecedented attack on a nuclear power plant, actually Chernobyl and a second major power plant in Ukraine, unprecedented unleashing of international economic sanctions by the West on Russia, unprecedented wave of refugees approaching like 2 million um, since just February 24th, so barely two weeks, so a million refugees a week, and so on. We've heard, however, invocations of unprecedented in many other contexts over the last several years relating to climate change and associated catastrophic natural disasters, and also relating to wars in many other parts of the world with mounting numbers of displaced persons globally. The UNHCR releases an annual report and this past year documented, uh, at that point, a 10 year um, increase in the number of displaced persons reaching over 80 million people last year. So this year will add to that tally with the massive displacement of people inside Ukraine and fleeing across its borders, as well as from other conflicts about which sometimes we know little and pay little attention, such as in Ethiopia just to mention one situation in Africa that's also on the brink of famine. We've seen unprecedented challenges from the global pandemic and we're hardly through that either. So I reflect that at a time when the world needs to be more united than ever to confront a panoply of enormous challenges that are threatening the health of people, their possibilities of food, water and shelter we are, I think, in some ways, witnessing the unraveling of world order, new lines of division and polarization between countries, in many cases within them as well, and escalating conflicts that will make it increasingly difficult for leaders to come together to confront the common challenges that are threatening, threatening the global community as a whole. So what is world order? It's a hard thing to describe in a couple uh, minutes here. But I think of it as a set of norms and principles and rules governed by international institutional arrangements, such as the universal membership of nation states and bodies like the United Nations and its subsidiary um, agencies, um, multilateral conferences, treaties, regimes that oversee their implementation, alliances, friendships, groups of countries that collaborate across a vast array of issues, and the United Nations Security Council, for example, countries come together and refer to themselves as friends of um, to tackle issues on children in armed conflict, or for example, friends of the protection of civilians, issues that are so utterly critical right now in the context of the violence in Ukraine. The bedrock principles of this international order that I've just described, these are principles enshrined in the UN Charter, also in the European context in the Helsinki Final Act of 1975, which invoke territorial integrity of states, sovereignty, non-intervention in the internal affairs of other states. And these have been prevailing principles or they've been tested in many different ways and trampled even in many different ways over the years since they've been adopted, especially enshrined in the UN Charter after World War II have been trampled by countries in the West, by our own country, as well as in the East. Um, nonetheless, we persist with a sense of, 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 uh, of non-aggression against the territory integrity of another state as one of the key principles of this order. So I think it's in no small measure because of that alone 
that um, the situation in Ukraine has galvanized the global response, a global peace movement to, to urge the countries to back down. And it reminded me of when the United States invaded Iraq, there was a similar kind of global outpouring and peace movement to urge the United States to, to turn away from that course of action as well. Um, what is dangerous today about the situation, I think, is the risk of escalatory chains in response to Putin's aggression in Ukraine. And that type of, of escalation raises questions about whether there can be a good outcome to the present situation. I always think that we have a vast toolkit now to prevent war, to signal the early warning of impending conflicts, and to, to respond to humanitarian crises and civilians in need. We have tremendous numbers of principles and agreements and United Nations Security Council resolutions and non-governmental organizations organized to respond and provide assistance to all of this. Uh, but once war back, uh, once war breaks out, the, um, I always think that the really good solutions are no longer at hand. So then we're left with trying to find solutions through um, tremendous difficulties and um, often less and less palatable um, kinds of outcomes. Today, the types of strategies that we see in place in response to the aggression and in the Ukraine by Russia rely on the one hand on increasing the, the military support, the weapons um, to Ukraine through various channels and even mercenaries, people from various parts of the world coming to fight in that, in that conflict, which in some ways reminds me of the Spanish Civil War as kind of harbinger of World War II. Um, and on the other hand, we have sanctions and sanctions have become increasingly a weapon of choice, especially in the West that were used systematically during the Cold War against the communist bloc. And they have been used in the post-Cold War in many, many situations um, in an effort to sway a population and its leadership to take an alternative course of action. And generally sanctions have been intended to provoke more or less a slow kind of slow social change. Um, and one might say in the best, best case, sanctions are welcomed by the, the host country or the targeted country, I should say, um, because they, they desire that kind of social change and political change. And that seemed to be the case with sanctions against South Africa. Um, however, it's also possible that sanctions against the country will, you know, have very severe consequences for the population of that country and cause what's known as the rally around the flag effect so that instead of moving the population and leadership to be willing to consider alternative solutions, it may harden their position with respect to um, the opponent. We see extraordinary kinds of sanctions placed now on, on, on Russia in a sweeping fashion that, that's never, I think, been tried before. And one of the escalatory dangers of this is that it, it, these sanctions threaten to isolate the Russian people as well as the leadership from the rest of the world. And, and that's part of their intent in terms of trying to pressure, um, in this case, even a, a quicker kind of political and social change um, in order to change the stakes for the war that's ongoing and in such a devastating way in, in Ukraine. Um, I saw, I think it was this morning that even FedEx and DHL have stopped working in Russia and, and Facebook you know, has shut down and, and all kinds of forms of communication are being cut, um, air travel and so on, so that it, it becomes increasingly difficult or, or it may well become increasingly difficult for Russians to have alternative information about what's going on and for the rest of us to reach out to them and, and sustain uh, a relationship of friendship to the people of Russia, even if we're in disagreement with the policies of their government. Um, it's surely easier 
to um, impose sanctions than it is to, to lift them and, and remedy what's been done economically. And we know this from the history of the use of sanctions. Wars always have unintended consequences. And this is another uh, great concern of mine. They develop their own logics. They spill over in any number of ways, geographically and otherwise. Escalation itself happens across a wide array of dimensions. We don't usually think about that, but it can happen geographically on types of weapons used, issues at stake, human and social costs, information flows, and certainly emotionally and psychologically. These dimensions become increasingly intertwined in new and more complex and more dangerous ways, um, uh, such as the risk of crossing from the conventional uh, to the nuclear threshold which has been discussed in the context of this conflict. Ending war requires a strategy. Many times it requires something that we would call saving face. This can be a very bitter pill to swallow for all parties concerned, especially if the stakes at the outcome of a conflict are essentially the same as they were at the outset, but now with all of the unbelievable loss of life and destruction and trail. Thank you so much, Janie. Um, really helps to, to get sort of a big picture uh, around what um, uh, sort of the, the rules and regulations that we assumed uh, in a world order um, become come into question. Um, so very helpful. Um, I'd like to take us now. Uh, we've been we've been speaking sort of from a thirty thousand foot uh, level in in um, thinking about the the politics of Europe, but I think um, one of the most important uh, reasons we wanted to bring this bring this panel forward is then to take those insights and um, better than understand what's happening to the people on the ground. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, I, I saw someone post something recently, why should we care about Ukraine's, U Ukraine, and my response was, how can we not care about Ukrainians? And so I think that uh, what David Schmidt will do for us now is bring us to um, some, some communications that he's had with friends and colleagues of ours uh, from Ukraine to better understand what's happening on the ground, um, the shock and surprise, I think, that many of the Ukrainians feel at this point um, as, as they're being invaded and um, uh, they're seeing uh, their, their lives um, overturned and overrun. So David Schmidt, if you would like to uh, take up uh, our last uh, formal speaker, and then we'll turn to what we've got already as a really good um, pool of questions in the Q&A. So keep them coming. David Schmidt. Thank you, Kathy, and uh, hello to our audience. Sometimes in ethics, we strive for objectivity by adopting a disinterested perspective, the view from the mountaintop, so to speak. But other times we seek to develop empathy by getting close to the ground, listening attentively to others' voices. Here, I wish to develop our empathy for Ukrainians by sharing some words from valued colleagues there. These messages have been edited to remove identifiers and personal comments. From February 24th, dear David, the worst morning in my life, pray for Ukraine. I come to home, my hometown near the east, airport is on fire. I wanna take my mom from here. Mom is alone and after COVID, and she had a birthday, so I decided to make a surprise. The 26th, troops attack my hometown now. I'm here with mom. Husband and brother are in Kyiv, protect territory. Another voice, the 12th. Dear David, information about Russia is quite controversial. We decided that in the case of invasion, we need to take our child away from Kyiv. Our friends from Lviv will host us. Husband will stay here and of course, will join local militaries. This totally terrifies me. It's hard to believe this is really happening. The 24th, we woke up at five because of sounds of explosions. 
That was really terrifying. Now all is quiet. We're at home. All streets are jammed, so no reason to start going somewhere. We've packed all necessary stuff needed for three to four days, and we'll decide if and when we should leave Kiev. I hope this night will be quiet. The 26th, we left Kiev. And then the 28th, we are in a small village in the Carpathian region. We are safe. But as for my husband, he is not in Kiev. He is not here. Another voice, the 21st, oh no, the 12th. Dear David, I don't know what to say. Everything is not clear. I go to work for a hospital. My students study. My daughter goes to school. For the first sight, everything is the same. Somebody from my friends is planning summer vacations in Greece. Somebody's buying a house right now. Nobody is talking about the war except TV. Everything was comparatively quiet for me until yesterday. After yesterday's news, I'm in silent panic. The war is very close for everyone. I couldn't even imagine it, and I don't know what to do. I'm going to pack all my documents together in any case and keep them all together, and I hope for peace. Thank you for your faith in me. Unfortunately, I don't have so deep faith in myself right now, and I feel so unconfident. In any case, I hope for the best. For today, this best means peace. The 26th. Now I'm on the way to the Carpathian Mountains with daughter. We will be there for a couple of days. Maybe I'll leave her there, and I'll return home. It depends on situation and mobilization. March 1. We have many volunteers. Yesterday, men who were discharged from military service due to heart diseases came to the hospital and asked to abolish this release because they want to fight for U Ukraine. There are not enough weapons for everyone. A lot of people went to Europe. I'm not ready yet. I want to act. The fourth. Our news is getting worse and worse. The fifth. Physically, I'm fine if we could say this word now. However, psychologically, I am very exhausted. More and more people are going abroad. I don't know if I'm doing right staying here, especially for my daughter, and it depresses me even more. I don't have a plan. The situation with nuclear power plants in general is beyond comprehension. Another voice, the 16th. Dear David, of course, we have distress and panic in Ukraine. I feel anxiety, but I do not plan to leave Kyiv or the country in any case. Since September last year, I started attending a psychotherapy group. It helps me a lot to stabilize my mental health and mood in general. I prefer to read positive news, which reports there will be no war. I want to believe that. The 25th, siren sounds are heard. Many neighbors went into hiding for the night. I stayed home. I'm probably not as afraid as the rest because I'm from an Eastern city and this has already happened to me. March 1, yesterday we discussed the topic of heroism. Each person is capable of this under certain conditions and depending on how he perceives them. I remember that when we talked about depression, it was heroic to make the bed or take a shower Someone can kill the enemy. Someone can help the neighbor. Perhaps this is a different degree of heroism in the war. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I justify my cowardice. March 6th, we are alive. We are still in the apartment. It's relatively quiet. I am very tired mentally. Yesterday, I met with friends from the psychotherapy group on Zoom. Almost all of them left Kiev. Today, I had a dream. I am standing in the middle of the room of my apartment and cannot decide to leave it. Woke up, I cried. My aunt died yesterday. She lived in Russia. She scolded Putin from the first days of his election. She said he was not human. Another voice, the 23rd. Dear David, Ukraine and Ukrainian people are stronger than it seems. We try to hold on and be brave. March 4th. My child is safe and me too, but I am very angry. It cannot be possible to cross out the life of the whole country. Another voice, February 24th. 
Dear David, 21st century Europe, the situation's like a horror movie, a bad horror. March 1st, David, where can we find a good hitman to shoot Putin? A couple of minutes ago, they blew up a square in Kharkov. Putin began to openly destroy residential areas. We really need NATO to close the sky over Ukraine. We can handle it on the ground. David, it seems that the whole world dreams of one thing, and now no one will allow himself to say Ukraine is something like Russia or Ukraine is a part of Russia. The whole world has united with us. Millions of people couldn't imagine this before. This is very valuable. God must hear the prayers of the whole world and end this. Glory to heroes. March 5th. David, thanks for your support. We are desperate. Civilians, ordinary people are being killed. Cities have been destroyed. I am with the eastern city of my family with all my thoughts and heart now. Russia destroyed all the places of my childhood where I went to rest, where my friends were. My family doesn't have a country house now, and there are no cats that lived there. All we want is to close the sky. I'm not an expert in politics, but when they say it will start a world war, it's already on. So many countries are helping Ukraine with money, weapons, sanctions, sending their soldiers and accepting refugees. Today is day 10. Psychologists say that a period of despair has come and one must not give up. Another voice, the 24th. Dear David, I'm waiting for a bus to go to my parents. Yes, luckily myself and all family is here, but I'm not sure it's safe anywhere now. The sixth, unfortunately, I wasn't with my mom on her birthday. I have to be honest with you, though after this honesty, you might be disappointed with me. I'm not somewhere in the center of events helping people. David, I'm in a safe place. I feel ashamed, guilty, and embarrassed about that. That probably wasn't the right decision, not to be somewhere in a place where I could help anyone. But fear and instinct sometimes take over, and before you become aware again, it's too late. Now I have to live with that and somehow forgive myself. My mom, my dad, and one of my siblings are in a village near a Western city. It's relatively safe. My other sibling and I are outside of Ukraine with relatives, so that's it. I hope I can be back home. I'm very confused about what to do next with my life. I have deep regret I'm not in Ukraine now. And the last voice, dear David, this is on the 12th. I don't know what to say is the best word that describes my feelings right now. We try to live a normal life, hoping for the better. I remember in 2014, 15, I had a plan, a backpack, and felt myself prepared. This time, I have no energy for doing anything, even for buying a flashlight. I've already said that the war could be compared to a natural disaster, like a tornado. There is not much you can do besides watching, terrified, what turn will it take the next second. My parents and husband's family are in an eastern city, spending most of the time in the basement. Luckily, they have one. Their city is under heavy artillery attack since today's morning. No water, no electricity, streets fighting going on. Russian Nazis are trying to get the path to Kyiv. The bridges around the city are destroyed to prevent it. Our family has escaped Kyiv yesterday. That was our decision to protect kids after the terrible night before. The curve road trying to avoid dangerous places to the Western Ukraine took almost 20 hours. We had a safe sleep at our friend's house and now are driving again. Uh, this person stopped writing to me, uh, was only able to do it by voice, has told me since then they're in a safe place, but she feels tremendous guilt and uh, unhappiness that she did not do more to try to get her parents to leave. And they're now stranded in a city in the East and cannot get out. So it's a serious thing, but uh, let me, I just wanna conclude by saying uh, this person, uh, one sh uh, there's, there are times for humor. And this person, when speaking to me, uh, they have with them a small puppy, uh, which they, they brought with them. She, they said it's the only possession they've kept that means anything to them. And while she was talking to me in the home where she, she's being hosted, there was a commotion in the next room. And it turned out the dog relieved himself on the living, living room rug. 
And my friend said to me, she's like, oh my gosh. She goes, you know, here we are in the house of these people who have taken us in and my dog pooped on the rug and everyone burst out laughing. And for a moment there was relief. Anyway, those are some of the voices from my contacts in Ukraine. Thank you so much, David. Very powerful. Um, I think um, I, I, I can't even imagine um, the fear and the guilt and the dread um, that, that people feel when they are under fire, truly under fire. So what I'd like to do next is take up some of the questions that I'm, I'm calling out of the Q&A. Um, and the first one, I think I'm gonna ask Conrad, if you would, if you would maybe get us started and, and um, we'll see if others have um, comments, but there are several questions about what could the US do? What is the responsibility of the US and NATO um, to, to step in? Um, should we uh, close the airspace? Should we, um, and again, not not what should we do, um, but definitely um, sort of what is the context in which these decisions get made? Um, what about troops on the ground? I know we have several military families who have joined us today who are very concerned about uh, uh, American troops on the ground and when that might come to pass. So I don't know, Conrad, if you could give us a little framing for those kinds of decisions and, and where they, where they come from, and then we'll see if others have, have comments on that. Uh, sure, Kathy, I, um, I hasten to, uh, to say that, uh, I am not a, a military expert, um, by any stretch of the imagination, but I can understand the point of view that uh, that using NATO planes, which is planes from, from each individual country that has those planes, but is NATO acting in, in unison, um, how that could be just too much. Uh, because once you move NATO into a conflict uh, uh, and you have a confrontation between a, a NATO plane and a Russian jet, uh, it's a war and it's a war between uh, by definition, between NATO and Russia. Uh, that said, um, we, uh, to the greatest extent possible, Ukraine has been clear about what it needs. We should provide it. Uh, if it's weapons, uh, if it's medicines now, the hospitals are being, are being bombed. Uh, it's clear they're going to need uh, uh, rapid deployment. I, I forget the exact name of it, but these, these uh, mobile hospitals, uh, for example. Uh, we can provide those things. As for the planes, uh, I mentioned a failure of imagination before. And not being an expert, I have to believe that there is something that we can provide that is going to help Ukraine to deal with uh, the, uh, the, the Russian flights over its airspace. I think uh, I struggle balancing my intellectual understanding of the difficulties involved in, um, in, in engaging uh, Russia in, in, a, in a war with the US, but I also then am struggling balancing that against the emotional um, reality of of the Ukrainians uh, uh, experience. So um, thank you for that. Anyone else have thoughts on, on David, please? I think the biggest thing we need to do, we have done very little on, and that's to redouble our efforts to bring peace between Russia and Ukraine. We could do much, much more on that. We've been very quiet about that and that is what is needed more than anything else other than the humanitarian aid and the medical aid. We need to redouble our efforts to bring about peace and an end to this war. Mm -hmm. So excellent. So, so just being much more forthright in, in diplomacy and, and finding diplomatic solutions. And, and I think I was speaking to, to, to someone yesterday and we were, we were thinking about the leadership of Zelensky in this moment, President Zelensky in this moment, um, and, and trying to um, uh, imagine his courage and in stepping into that uh, diplomatic space, um, unequivocally uh, trying to, 
to find a solution for the people of Ukraine. Um, excellent. Um, I have another series of, of questions here about the role of Putin. And um, David, maybe you can start us off, but Janie, if, if we could hear from you as well, David McFadden, um, if you would, uh, you know, it, 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 noting someone has noted that Putin is nearly 70 years old um, and trying to imagine um, sort of what, what his end, end game might be in terms of this as a, um, as a, as a strategy. Well, I think uh, it's a very good point, and the politics of resentment are all about Putin. Um, he is trying, I think, personally, to reverse the collapse of the Soviet Union. He would like to reclaim the Russian imperial control, certainly over Ukraine and maybe beyond. And I think the only thing that's going to deal with that is the Russian people. And we need to support in every way we can the Russian people that are going to the streets against Putin. Uh, that is the only hope. I don't think they have a succession, a successor groomed, but we've, you know, we have to get rid of Putin, and I don't think assassination is appropriate, but we have to get the people to demand that he leave. Interesting. They need to Kate. learn they need to learn John Locke and the Glorious Revolution. <laughs> Tell the king to go away. Interesting. So so Janie, um, you know, sort of uh, that and and sort of pig, piggybacking a question that's come up, sort of what what is Putin really afraid of? It 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 uh, he, he we bring forward this idea that um, uh, uh, there is a fear of NATO getting too close to his borders, but Ukraine has never threatened Russia um, with any kind of certainly military engagement or territorial um, uh, engagement. So, Janie, what are you what are you thinking on that on that on that uh, question? What what is it? What is the fear about? Yeah. I I would go back to the times that I spent in Finland and did research um, on Finnish you know, diplomacy um, to try to find a way out at that time of, of the Cold War. And it was really more than just a way out of the Cold War. It was really a way out of World War II. So one of the, the paradoxes of, of the end of World War II was that there really wasn't an end. Um, Europe just got split up sort of de facto by whoever landed up in which territory and took over. And that left, you know, East Germany in the hands of, of, of the Soviet Union and the Eastern European countries under the control of the Soviet Union. And a few, a few exceptional states outside of that, that block structure of what ended up being NATO in the West and the Warsaw Pact in the East. And Finland and Sweden, you know, along with Austria and Switzerland were the neutral countries. And so I spent, you know, quite a bit of time studying what their diplomacy was and their perspective was. And, and through, you know, that kind of lens to try to understand what was the, the concern on the part of the Soviet Union. And my takeaway was that there was a real sense of fear on the part of the Soviet Union about this question of being encircled you know, by, by NATO, by being confronted by NATO. At the same time, there was this tremendous fear in the West that, um, that the Soviets had all these conventional forces, uh, vast tanks and armory and so on, and that they could, you know, deploy those forces literally up to Western Europe and the Eastern Bloc and, and roll over Europe. And so I think, you know, there was this fear on both sides. And one of the strategies to um, balance, you know, these fears was to create a nuclear arms race, which of course put, you know, any kind of, of accommodation between the, si the sides on a kind of hair's breadth. And I remember, you know, 
being myself, you know, in Europe and traveling different places and seeing the so-called Iron Curtain and and the specter that people painted of the, the, the tanks rolling over the, the borders. And I think that as, as Putin, you know, mobilized all these forces around Ukraine in the last year or so, and increasingly since December, um, there, there surely was a sense of disbelief on the part of the Ukrainians as, as David Schmidt's, you know, remarks demonstrate. But I think also from the West, like, this was the scenario. <laughs> and like, how could it be that it was actually gonna happen, you know, all these years later and, you know, all of these decades after the end of the Cold War. So I think it, it, it just demonstrates that the security architecture which emerged in the post-Cold War period, you know, wasn't adequate to solve the question of the Russian security, um, concerns and and I think we're just we're left with that reality that 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 piece was not taken into account in a way that would have mitigated uh, what's transpired and and I certainly agree that it looks like Putin is trying to reinvent um, a Soviet era you know that's long long past um, part of um, the landscape but um, at such a tremendous, tremendous cost. So it, seeing him on TV and his, his broadcasted remarks about his justification for war on Ukraine were sort of chilling reminders of an encounter I had with a delegation meeting with Milosevic. And, and that was, you know, before he unleashed a campaign of, of ethnic cleansing against the Kosovars. And, um, the argumentation was also similar. And I, I think Conrad said something about this, about claims to history. And, and there have been these distorted, you know, claims to history to bolster, you know, and justify um, what are acts of aggression and crimes against humanity and war crimes and, and genocide. And, um, you know, we see also so, so quickly now investigations into you know, war crimes and crimes against humanity. So what kind of pressure can be brought to bear on per Putin personally um, in the circumstances, probably the most pressing question, you know, before us. Um, yeah, thank you, Janie, but, that's, that's, that's great. I'm gonna pass it to, uh, I think I had Conrad and then David Schmidt. Um, and also uh, I think I'm, I'm, I've been feeling a sense of powerlessness, um, not just of myself, but of, of my country. Uh, powerlessness of the West, powerlessness of NATO. Um, Conrad, uh, please, and then we'll go to David Schmidt. Uh, thanks. Yeah, just uh, briefly on Putin, I, and before I say that, I want to qualify. I think it's important to keep our eye on the ball, and uh, there really is not much we can do about Putin. Uh, what we can do is help Ukraine to, uh, to survive uh, this uh, terrible assault. Uh, but that said, I, I was wondering in the early days, what would motivate Putin to do something as, as, as crazy, as risky as this? Uh, you know, the, the, the chief, the number one priority of any dictator is to stay in power uh, and preferably for life because uh, the alternative uh, might not be pretty. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's conceivable that he thought this would really clinch it for him. He had so much success before taking uh, uh, taking prop, uh, uh, territory from Ukraine, uh, and there was a relatively weak response in his view. Um, and he thought he could get away with this, and that uh, he had this incredible bump in the polls, and that would be it. That's the only thing I can think. Um, it doesn't mean he's he's making smart decisions uh, about his future, but uh, he's thinking about how to stay in power. Kathy, the uh, question about uh, Putin's succession raises another question, and that is, how will this war be concluded? Um, and if, they, if if Russia were to say today they're pulling out and you know it's, it's done, well, it's not. It wouldn't be done. You have a devastated country left in its wake, and we would face a whole set of questions about what our responsibilities are at that point. I just want to point out that in ethics, there is a strong tradition of reflection on war 
called the just war tradition. But it traditionally has focused on when is it justified to start a war, by whom and under what conditions, and then when you're fighting, what are the rules of engagement ethically? You know, what can you do and what can't you do to prosecute a war? Very little has been written until recently about what do you do when the war is over? And what ethically are the ways to wind things down? Uh, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves because I'm afraid this is going to go on for some time. But when we talk about things like succession and change and we're looking into the future, I want the West to remember when it's over, it's not over. And our responsibilities continue. They, they must continue. David Schmidt, I'm going to stay with you for just a quick minute. Um, another question that came up um, that I thought was really from an interesting perspective. Um, Maria asked, how do those of us who come from families who fled repressive regimes speak to our neighbors and friends born and raised in American democracy to help them understand what's at stake? Um, David Schmidt, do you have any thoughts about how how we can speak to um, friends and neighbors um, to, to, to help people understand what's at stake more than, um, uh, again, not trivial, but 50 cents more a gallon of gas is something that people can see and understand in the United States, um, but, but that the stakes are so much larger. That's hard to answer for, for two reasons. One is I'm not in her situation. I, I haven't fled a country with a repressive regime, regime, so I can only imagine. Plus, the quality of our political and civic discourse right now in the United States is not, is not real healthy. And people, people get polarized and people get upset. I would simply say if someone has experience, direct personal experience, that gives them a perspective on this, you can do everyone a favor, I think, by, sh by speaking to your own truth. Uh, doesn't mean necessarily engaging in argument. It, it means bearing witness to saying, this is what it was like for me. And simply put it out there so people can hear it. That's the first step, I think, in dialogue and hopefully in building common understanding. Uh, but it's a challenge. I, I, I applaud her sentiment, and I, would, and I would say, if you can, just speak up and bear witness. I think that's, that's, that's uh, good advice, and um, hopefully we can all do that in speaking civilly and honestly with, with one another as, as we um, continue to talk about um, the war in Ukraine and its um, foundations and um, as, as it may play out. Um, any other thoughts or comments from our panelists before we draw to a close? We've got loads of questions, but we're really um, short on time here. And I want to make sure there's nothing left that my panelists would like to add to the conversation. I would just simply say, I think we're all acutely aware that this conversation needs to continue. And um, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything to announce at this point, but I would like our audience to know that uh, we envision having more uh, panels or conversations like this, and I would ask people to stay posted. Uh, you can't cover it all in, in one afternoon. Very, very good. And, and we will be um, thinking about a next um, uh, uh, set of conversations that we can help to facilitate. Another question that's come up, um, if you can see my screen now, um, a question that's come up in the chat, uh, people asking how they can donate, where they can, um, how they can be of service uh, to, to Ukraine. I think um, there are two things. Uh, one, uh, Fairfield's Humanitarian Action Club, uh, as Janie Leatherman, as Dr. Leatherman mentioned, she is uh, the director of the Humanitarian Action Program here at Fairfield. We have a Humanitarian Action Club that's very active. And uh, they've raised um, over $1,500 already for Nova Ukraine. Um, and I have here a link to that um, uh, organization, which is sending uh, money for humanitarian aid. Uh, we also have noted that CNN has a variety of also vetted, well vetted um, uh, organizations to which you can contribute. So we, we would commend you to those organizations to 
provide um, either money or, or goods. I've heard both um, from friends in Ukraine, uh, one, that they need money to be able to purchase things, but two, the supply chain is so compromised that um, it's difficult for them to get uh, access, even if they have money to resources. Conrad, we lost you for a moment. Do you have a last word? Uh, and we'll, we'll draw to a close. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I will go back to the earlier question about how do you talk to others? And uh, I would encourage the viewers to tell stories uh, and discuss and listen to their, to their interlocutors uh, and be positive. Uh, look to the future. Uh, it's, it, it's very difficult under the circumstances, but I see Ukrainians doing it all the time, and I think that's something we can emulate. Um, think about the future. Thank you so much, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, an incredibly an insightful set of comments and great responses to the questions. Thanks so much to the audience. We were up over 130 people for a while, so we had have great interest in this topic. I know it's of great concern to so many of us uh, here in the US, uh, wanting to know more about the conflict, better understand our own role, and also um, know how we can um, be of service. So thanks to everyone today, and um, please keep your eye out for further conversations uh, that we'll plan uh, over the next couple of months. Have a good afternoon.